It was the year 1959, Anno Domini. In China, it was the year of the dog, the year 5,720. It was the year a rocket hit the moon. Even as man probed more deeply into space, this world was shrinking beneath his feet. 1959 was the year two million travelers took their first giant steps across the skies of Earth by jet airliner, the shining silver conveyance which has been called the greatest revolution in transportation in all time. In the years since, the jetliner has come to connect every continent, every major city, and is now a part of the daily lives of millions of the people of the Earth. This is how it began, the first year of the jet age. The 707, year one. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is your captain. Welcome to the jet age. We're cruising now at 35,000 feet. Our speed is Mach number 0 0.83, or about 605 miles per hour. On our flight plan today, we'll be covering 4,800 miles in eight hours, and we'll be in smooth air above the weather, cruising in sunshine all the way. This aircraft is the 707 Intercontinental. It's the largest jet airliner in the world. Incidentally, the first one of these big jets made its initial flight as the year 1959 began. It was January 11th, and Seattle weather was not ideal for a first flight. Here she comes. At the conclusion of the Intercontinental's first flight, reporter asked pilot... How was it? Fine, everything went real well. Did you have a nice ride? Yeah, it was real good. The weather didn't cooperate too well, though. Well, oh, you always wait for rain. <laughs> we'll Seems see you like tomorrow. around here. Right, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, good. fine, thank you. When tomorrow came, the weather was more cooperative. Flight test, you're in, Sarah Long 4. At 20,000 feet over Puget Sound, rendezvous, and the test program begins. Flight test, you read 0260. The chase plane pilot observes and records through a camera on his helmet. He also transmits a non-technical observation. Look real pretty in your new airplane. Just clean as a wet sail. We'll take it on up to our planter to 300 knots. And so the test program would go through 27 weeks of higher speeds, heavier loadings, increasing demands on performance to verify the engineer's design objectives for this, the Intercontinental Series of 707 Jetliner. 
As the new model began its flying life, another member of the 707 family was ready to enter airline service. Los Angeles International Airport, January 23rd. Another jetliner, the first model of the 707 series, waits to be christened. Ready to start the engines and a new era in American transportation, the governor and his lady. I christened this airplane, the 707 Jet Flagship California. When I press this button, the engines of the first scheduled passenger plane ever to fly across the United States will start. Good luck and Godspeed, Jet Flagship California. Four passengers, eight crew members, are bound for New York and a place in history. after takeoff, they were cruising six miles above the ancient canyons of the Old West. Huckleberry Finn was only two hours from New York City. out of Los Angeles, they began their descent, and 112 charter members of the jet age shared in the new record. In four hours, three minutes, they had crossed America and seen this country shrink in half. began 707 service, Pan American was completing its third month of jet operations from New York. Flying the North Atlantic run to London in six and a half hours, to Paris in seven hours. In these first three months, more travelers had come to Europe in a single jetliner than by the Queen Mary. With delivery of more 707s, Pan Am began service to Rome. On March 20th, the jet age came to San Francisco this historic transportation event. First, of course, the real star of our show is our Boeing 707 jetliner. Uh, 
next on the stand, the president of TWA. Thank you very much. This will be the first commercial jet flight to leave from San Francisco, and this is going to make your city one of the first and one of the greatest jet air transport centers in the world, and you can be very proud of that. In four and a half hours from the time that we take off, we'll be in New York. And TWA could be proud of its new jet operation. In the first two weeks of service to New York, it completed 28 consecutive departures on schedule, all with a single 707. businessman could be a coast-to-coast -coast commuter, have breakfast in San Francisco, business luncheon in Manhattan, and home again, all in the same day. Flight testing took the Intercontinental to an altitude of 42,000 feet, a speed of 665 miles per hour. The airplane took its punishment gracefully and proved again the integrity of its structure. At the same time, another test was concluding, underwater in the hydrostatic test tank. In a year of hydro fatigue testing, the pressurized cabin of the jet transport had undergone 50,000 flight cycles, equivalent to more than 40 years of airline operation. The structure had shown no signs of weakening. of April, the body was purposely sliced open in several places to see if the skin would rip. Under repeated cycles of heavy loads and abnormally high pressures, the torn body held together. Structural engineers call this verifying the fail-safe principle of 707 design. In the heat of the California desert, April was the cruelest month. Here, at Edwards Air Force Base, the Federal Aviation Agency of the United States government was beginning its examination of the new Intercontinental 707. This airplane would not be permitted to carry a passenger until the FAA had given its certificate of airworthiness. first desert trial for these flight test men from Seattle and Washington, D.C. A year before, they had written the rules for jets in the test program for the first 707s. Now they were putting it on the line with the biggest one, the 707 Intercontinental. This airplane must prove its designer's claims for all the Intercontinental 707s yet to come. April 
April 15th, the FAA's check pilots began examination of the airplane's flying personality. What these men cannot see, other eyes will detect as the airplane's every nerve and muscle are measured in numbers. Day after day, they took the pulse of the jet, flying from stratosphere to sagebrush level, maneuvering 150 tons of aircraft from stalling speed to nearly 700 miles per hour. Intercontinental was taking the test for a rejected takeoff. At full takeoff speed, they hit the brakes. How much runway to stop 150 tons traveling at 150 miles per hour? In three weeks testing, they got their answers. This airplane could make a safe stop weighing nine tons more than takeoff maximum. one engine on takeoff. How fast can you climb on three engines? Next morning, you will deliberately set the flaps wrong. Pull the nose up too soon. What's the recovery time? In the last week of May, Summer came full on the desert, and the men took a break before a final examination. At the field, they're calibrating engine thrust. Four of these Pratt & Whitney turbojets can put out more than 63,000 pounds of thrust. That's the takeoff power they want for tomorrow's test. The airplane stands for the weighing in ceremony while ballast tanks are installed in place of 180 passengers. Filled with water, the tanks equal 45,000 pounds of payload, plus an overload of nine more tons. The airplane now weighs 316,000 pounds. Late in the day, the last pre-flight conference. Tomorrow's test would not count if conditions were not executed to plan. men were ready. The airplane was ready for maximum weight takeoff. The morning air was cool and calm. Conditions were ideal. The final test could be made at 316,000 pounds. were over, and the big 707 had a fresh paint job for the last act in the federal test program, long-range flights under airline operating conditions. On the morning of May 28th, flight test was ready for the first truly intercontinental flight of the jet age. The flight plan reads, Seattle to Rome, Italy, direct, 5,800 miles nonstop. Among the passengers, William M. Allen, president of Boeing. Thirty-nine thousand feet over Canada, 
power was reduced to long-range crews. Airspeed, 550 miles per hour. out from Seattle, they crossed the English Channel. The Swiss Alps behind them, it was downhill over the Mediterranean and the letdown for Rome. Fifty-eight hundred miles in eleven hours, six minutes. Here was a record for president and pilot to enjoy with a new airplane, and a record to share with an old jet back home. On July 15th, the prototype 707 was five years old, but the party was in another room as the FAA announced certification of the Intercontinental. Five months of testing had paid off. After 379 hours of flight, the Federal Aviation Agency had approved the big one for airline service. Pan American named its first intercontinental Jet Clipper Liberty Bell. And while Liberty Bell made headlines in her diplomatic mission to Moscow, the prototype began its sixth year of flight, still testing design innovations for the 707s yet to come. Australia's overseas airline prepares to launch jet service across the Pacific Ocean. I named this aircraft Sydney Kenda and may God bless all his flying there. First to cross the Pacific by jet. Qantas passengers today can see the world's mightiest ocean shrink to a mere 15 hours in width. jet service to more of America and set new standards for efficient operations. These golden jets didn't linger long on the ground. In the time required to refuel, they would deplane a hundred passengers or more tidy up in the cabin, and soon have new supplies going aboard for a hundred departing travelers. By late summer, each one of these golden jets was averaging 10 hours of flight every day. through daylight saving zones, passengers were arriving in Denver 10 minutes later than their Chicago departure time. 
and Continental held the record for the Los Angeles-Chicago run, three hours. On August 26th, intercontinental jet service began. There were curious new problems created that day in San Francisco. As the miles were shortened between cultures, it would seem that a man must learn a new manner of dress. And those flowers would be embarrassingly fresh when he reached London in 11 hours. On September 5th, Liberty Bell enjoyed the combined blessings of East and West as San Francisco's mayor joined with a Japanese priest to celebrate inauguration of intercontinental schedules between America and the Orient. 119 passengers will be in Honolulu in five hours. Departure time, 10.47 a.m. This evening at 8 o'clock Tokyo time, they'll see the lights of the Ginza, only 13 flying hours from the Golden Gate. In October, the 707-220 completed the federal test program, and on November 5th, the FAA announced certification for this, the third model of the 707 family of jet airliners. December 3rd, Braniff International Airways flies home to Texas with its El Dorado Superjet. Now, a Midwesterner could waken up a cold winter's morn, decide to jet to Florida, and be there by noon. south of the border for a summer fiesta, only a few hours from that cold winter's morning. December 6th, another world traveler was en route from North America in a specially equipped 707 operated by the Military Air Transport Service of the United States Air Force. Air Force designation for its version of the 707 is VC-137A. Title of this mission, Operation Monsoon. First port of call, Rome, Italy, where Mr. Eisenhower was met by President Gronke. And so the journey began, from Rome to Ankara. 400,000 Turks were there to greet an American who would meet the people of 11 nations in 19 days, coming to countries American presidents had never seen before. Karachi, Pakistan. And gifts from President Ayub. Then to India. Here, the dream of a Kansas farm boy was fulfilled as he stood before the Taj Mahal. Thence to Tehran and a talk with the Shah of Iran. Four hours later, Athens, Greece. And when he bade King Paul goodnight, Mr. Eisenhower had covered the entire empire of Alexander the Great in one jet day. station called Gare du Nord, a walk and talk with President de Gaulle. On departure from Paris, the VC-137's captain said, 
The 19-day mission could never have been without the jet. It would have taken more than a month. Then, North Africa. At Casablanca, King Mohammed V and half a million Moroccans and mutual memories of an old war in their desert. As the tour ended, the travelers said, we have much to learn and to give in our journeys to lands of other faiths. Thank you very much indeed for coming out on this cold night to welcome my party and me back home. It's certainly good to be here. Now, I must remind you that this morning we had breakfast in Madrid, uh, lunch in Casablanca, and now we are home at an hour which uh, by our getting up time was uh, five or six o'clock in the morning. So you can realize that this is not a time for a very erudite, an informing speech, but <laughs> I do want to bring, just say the one thing. Everywhere we came, everywhere we went, people sent this back, a message of Merry Christmas and goodwill to all the people of the United States, and in that message, I join myself this evening to all of you, everybody, everywhere. Good night. Christmas Day, the 707 set three new world records for speed between Old World and New World. And this Earth grew a bit smaller yet. And these were the makers of the jets. They could look back on seven years of work leading to this year one. It was the year 1952 when their company decided to build the first 707, and they saw it fly in 54. Then there were two more years of test and proof before they saw the first airline order. Now they were building for the airlines of 11 nations. Work had begun for Irish International Airlines and for Western Airlines on the speedy new model called 720. They were shaping intercontinental 707s for South African A's and for Varig of Brazil. They were moving up number 102 for Deutsche Lufthansa. 101 rolled out the door as the year ended. And jetliner number 100 emerged from paint shop in the colors of Air India International. At year's end, the medium range 720s were rolling for United Airlines. India's Rolls-Royce powered Intercontinentals were ready to go. Lufthansa flew home to Germany in record time. Sabines was scheduled into Africa and into Russia. And the first new Model 720 at a level flight speed of Mach 0.9, as promised. An intercontinental for BOAC made a big test hop and history's first non-stop crossing of the North Pacific from Seattle to Tokyo. Air France was ready for passengers.
British Overseas Airways had its U.S. certification. Granite had begun service. America's domestic trunk lines completed a year with 707 cabins 90% full. All the years of airline planning and investment were beginning to pay off as the public welcomed the jet age with two million tickets. As the flight crews of Air France prepared for 707 service, a philosophical discussion took place. Uh, have a date in New York over the weekend and return to Paris for work on Monday. That's right, and Tuesday morning have breakfast in Tokyo if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Captain Cass, from an economic standpoint, uh, what do you consider to be the meaning of the, the jets for the world? For the world, uh, it, will, uh, it will increase the tourist, I think the tourism and everybody uh, will be able to go from a country to another and for Europe we expect an invasion of American citizens for the coming years. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. invasion could begin. A traveler could fly around the world in 40 hours. Now, you might take that giant step toward the horizon of your own dream. From anywhere in the USA, Paris for breakfast. <laughs> in Rome. From Rome to Istanbul. Then, a flying carpet ride through the Middle East and down to Bombay. There was a story in the Bombay News which said, The jet era is opening the doors for the intermingling of various cultures, a prelude to the demolition of barriers erected by lack of contact and by prejudice. No land is now isolated. No people sheltered from the friendly gaze of others. As you arrive in Bangkok, Thailand, you're about halfway around this little world. East or west, the United States is less than one day away as the jet flies. Three hours northeast, lies the great port of the South China Sea. You're on final approach to Hong Kong.
last day of the year 1959. Take off beside Hong Kong Harbor. And as evening settled beyond the hills of China, they were ending this year of the dog and making ready for the year of the rat. into Tokyo, you think back to the 16th century and Magellan, three years to circle the globe. You think of Jules Verne and his incredible man who made it round in 80 days. And today, four generations after Phileas Fogg, you're circling the world in less than two days jet time. The world hasn't changed, you have. You think of the old words, the Far East. It doesn't seem so far. Hawaii. It's your last stop. You're only five hours from home. As you climb up to where the stratosphere begins, you're seven miles above the Pacific and it's easy to feel superior to that world shrinking beneath your feet, the flight has provided a new viewpoint. But it's up to you to see these new dimensions. Look at the four corners of the Earth, moving closer to Main Street. And the people of Tokyo must learn that they're almost as close now to Chicago as Chicago was to Seattle. In California, they're learning to look across a continent and an ocean toward London, one giant step from San Francisco. Europe is closer to Los Angeles than it was to New York. And Berlin may come to Bangkok in eight hours. They've got a new outlook from Australia, too. Since tides first turned in Sydney Harbor, the land has seemed a world away from America. Now. It's only half a day. Pacific tides have thundered for ages among the time-worn rocks of Hawaii. And the same tide is coming into Seattle. It was here the 707 began the flights that have changed the shape of this ocean, this world. Before this tide has come to its high water line, a jet will have crossed the Atlantic. When the tide has ebbed and run out again, a jetliner will have spanned the Pacific. In this jet age, our homes are only as far apart as the next turning of the tide. Nineteen fifty-nine. This was the year the 707 first made its mark in the skies, and some of the miles between men were dissolved in vapor. It was the year to look at records, to think of promises, and a time to speak of beginnings. For this was the 707, year one. Ah, ah.